Now, if the tribunal please, it might have been fitting and appropriate for me to present the case on collaboration with Japan and the attack on the United States on this December the 7th, 1945, the fourth anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor. However, our plan was to proceed chronologically, so that part of the case must wait its turn for presentation next week. <clears throat> we now come to the climacteric of this amazing story of wars of aggression. Perhaps one of the most colossal misestimations in history. When Hitler's intuition led him and his associates to launch aggressive war against the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. In my last appearance before the tribunal, I presented an account of the aggression against Czechoslovakia. In the meantime, our British colleagues have given you the evidence covering the formulation of the plan to attack Poland and the preparation and initiation of actual aggressive war. In, ad in addition, they have laid before the tribunal the story of the expansion of the war into a general war of aggression involving the planning and execution of attacks on Denmark, Norway, Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Yugoslavia, Greece. And in doing so, the British prosecution has marshaled and presented to the court the various international treaties, agreements, and assurances, and the evidence establishing the breaches of those treaties and assurances. I should like to present to the tribunal now the account of the last but one of the defendant's acts of aggression, the invasion of the USSR. The section of the indictment in which this crime is charged is count one, section 4F, paragraph six, headed, German invasion on June 22, 1941 of the USSR territory in violation of the non-aggression pact of 23 August, 1939. The first sentence of this paragraph is the one with which we shall be concerned today. And it reads, on June 22, 1941, the Nazi conspirators deceitfully denounced the non-aggression pact between Germany and the USSR and without any declaration of war invaded Soviet territory, thereby beginning a war of aggression against the USSR. The documents bearing on this phase of the case are contained in document book Mark P, which we now hand to the court. And first, if the tribunal please, the inception of the plan. As a point of departure for the story of the aggression against the Soviet Union, I should like to take the date 23 August, 1939. On that day, just a week before the invasion of Poland, the Nazi conspirators caused Germany to enter into the Treaty of Non-Aggression with the USSR, which is referred to in this section of the indictment, which I have just quoted. This treaty, document number TC-25, has been introduced in evidence by our British colleagues, but it contains two articles which I should like to bring to the particular attention of the tribunal. Article one provided as follows. <laughs> the two contracting parties undertake to refrain from any act of violence, any aggressive action, 
or any attack against one another, whether individually or jointly with other powers. And Article 5 provided, should disputes or conflicts arise between the contracting parties regarding questions of any kind whatsoever, the two partners would clear away these disputes or conflicts solely by friendly exchanges of views or, if necessary, by arbitration commission. It is well to keep these solemn pledges in mind during the course of the story which is to follow. This treaty was signed for the German government by the defendant Ribbentrop. Its announcement came <coughs> as somewhat of a surprise to the world, since it appeared to constitute a reversal of the previous trend of Nazi foreign policy. The explanation for this about face has been provided, however, by no less eminent a witness than the defendant Ribbentrop himself. In a discussion which he had with the Japanese ambassador, Oshima, at Fushu on 23 February 1941, a report of that conference was forwarded by Ribbentrop to certain German diplomats in the field for their strictly confidential and purely personal information. This report we now have. It is number 1834 PS. I offer it in evidence as Exhibit USA 129. The original German document At page two of the English translation, Ribbentrop tells Oshima the reason for the fact with the USSR. That's page four of the original German. I quote, then when it came to war, the Fuhrer decided on a treaty with Russia, a necessity for avoiding a two-front war. In view of this spirit of opportunism, which motivated the Nazis in entering into this solemn pledge of arbitration and non-aggression, it is not very surprising to find that they regarded it, as they did all treaties and pledges, as binding on them only so long as it was expedient for them to be bound. that they did so regard it as evident <coughs> from the fact that even while the, the campaign in the West was still in progress, they began to consider the possibility of launching a war of aggression against the USSR. In his speech to the Reich and Gauleiters at Munich in November of 1943, which is set forth in our document number L172, already in evidence as USA exhibit number 34. The defendant Yodel admitted, and I shall read from page seven of the English translation, which is at page 15 of the original German text. I quote, parallel with all these developments, realization was steadily growing of the danger drawing constantly nearer from the Bolshevik East. Uh, that danger... Mr. Alderman, I, yes. did you say page seven? Yes. I seem to have only five pages of it. Oh, which... It's yeah. numbered at the top of the page. Are you reading L172? Yes. Oh, I beg your pardon. I thought you were reading 1834 PS. Yeah. Yes, go on. Parallel with all these developments, realization was steadily growing of the danger drawing constantly nearer from the Bolshevik East. That danger, which has been only too little perceived in Germany, and latterly, for diplomatic reasons, had deliberately to be ignored. 
However, the Fuhrer himself has always kept this danger steadily in view. And even as far back as during the Western Campaign, had informed me of his fundamental decision to take steps against this danger the moment our military position made it at all possible. At the time this statement was made, however, the Western Campaign was still in progress, and so any action in the East necessarily had to be postponed for the time being. On 22 June 1940, however, the Franco-German armistice was signed at Compiègne and the campaign in the West, with the exception of the war against Britain, came to an end. The view that Germany's key to political and economic dominance lay in the elimination of the USSR as a political factor and in the acquisition of Lebensraum at their expense had long been basic in Nazi ideology. As we have seen, this idea had never been completely forgotten, even while the war in the West was in progress. Now, flushed with the recent success of their arms, and yet keenly conscious of both their failure to defeat Britain and the needs of their armies for food and raw materials, the Nazis began serious consideration of the means for achieving their traditional ambition by conquering the Soviet Union. The situation in which Germany now found herself made such action appear both desirable and practical. As early as August of 1940, General Thomas received a hint from the defendant Goering that planning for a campaign against the Soviet Union was already underway. Thomas, at that time, was the chief of the Wirtschaft Rüstung Amt, or the Office for Economy and Armaments, of the OKW. I should perhaps mention that this office is generally, generally referred to in the German documents by the abbreviation W-I-R-U with an umlaut, A-M-T. General Talmud tells about receiving this information from Goering in his draft of a work entitled Basic Facts for a History of German War and Armaments Economy which he prepared during the summer of 1944. This book is our document number 2353 PS. And has already been admitted into evidence as exhibit USA 35. Now, I'm sorry, it, it was marked that for identification purposes. <laughs> I now offer it in evidence as USA 35. On pages 313 to 315 of this work, Thomas discusses the Russo-German Trade Agreement of 1939 and relates how since the Soviets were delivering quickly and well under this agreement and were requesting war materials in return, there was much pressure in Germany until early in 1940 for increased delivery on the part of the Germans. However, at page 315, he has the following to say about the change of heart expressed by the German leaders in August of 1940. I read from page nine of the English translation. On, on August 14, the chief of the V. Rue, during a conference with the Reichsmarschall Goering, 
was informed that the Fuhrer desired punctual del delivery to the rations only until spring 1941. Later on, we would have no further interest in completely satisfying the Russian demand. This illusion moved the chief of the B. Rue to give priority to matters concerning Russian war economy. I shall refer to this statement again later when I discuss the <coughs> preparation for the economic exploitation of Soviet territory expected to be captured. At that time, too, I shall introduce evidence which will show that in November of 1940, Goering categorically informed Thomas that a campaign was planned <coughs> against the USSR. Preparations for so large an undertaking as an invasion of the Soviet Union necessarily entailed, even this many months in advance of the date of the execution, certain activity in the East in the way of construction projects and strengthening of forces. Such activity could not be expected to pass unnoticed by the Soviet intelligence service. Counterintelligence measures were obviously called for. In an OKW directive signed by the defendant Yodel and issued to the counterintelligence service abroad on 6 September 1940, such measures were ordered. This directive is our number 1229 PS, and I offer it in evidence as exhibit USA 130 photostat of the captured German document. 1229. 1229 PS. This directive pointed out that the activity in the East must not be permitted to create the impression in the Soviet Union that an offensive was being prepared and outline the line for the counterintelligence people to take to disguise this fact. The text of the directive indicates by necessary implication the extent of the preparations already underway, and I should like to read it to the tribunal. The Eastern Territory will be manned stronger in the weeks to come. By the end of October, the status shown on the enclosed map is supposed to be reached. These regroupings must not create the impression in Russia that we are preparing an offensive in the East. On the other hand, Russia will realize that strong and highly trained German troops are stationed in the gouvernement in the eastern provinces and in the protectorate. She should draw the conclusion that we can at any time protect our interests, especially on the Balkan, with strong forces against Russian seizure. For the work of our own intelligence service, as well as for the answer to questions of the Russian intelligence service, the following directives apply. One, the respective total strength of the German troops in the East is to be veiled as far as possible by giving news about a frequent change of the army units there. This change is to be explained by movements into training camps, regroupings. Two, the impression is to be created that the center of the massing of troops is in the southern part of the Gouvernement in the Protectorate and in Austria, and that the massing in the North is relatively unimportant. <coughs> when it, three, when it comes to the equipment situation of the units, especially of the armored divisions, things are to be exaggerated if necessary. Four, by suitable news, the impression is to be created 
that the anti-aircraft protection in the East has been increased considerably after the end of the campaign in the West, and that it continues to be increased with captured <coughs> French material on all important targets. Five, concerning improvements on railroads, roads, airdromes, etc., it is to be stated that the work is kept within normal limits, is needed for the improvement of the newly won Eastern Territories and serves primarily economic traffic, economical traffic. The Supreme Command of the Army, OKH, decides to what extent correct details, that is, numbers of regiments, man manning of garrisons, etc., will be made available to the defense for purposes of counter espionage. Chief of the Arm Supreme Command of the Armed Forces by order of, signed by Yodel. Early in November of 1940, Hitler reiterated his previous orders and called for a continuation of preparations, promising further and more definite instructions as soon as this preliminary work produced a general outline of the Army's operational plan. This order was contained in a top secret directive from the Führer's headquarters, number 18, dated 12 November, 1940, signed by Hitler and initialed by Jodl. It is number 444 PS in our numbered series and is already in evidence as GB exhibit number 116. The directive begins by saying, I quote, the preparatory measures of Supreme Headquarters for the prosecution of the war in the near future are to be made along the following lines. It then outlines plans for the various theaters and the policy regarding relations with other countries and says regarding the USSR and I read now from page three, paragraph numbered five of the English translation. Russia. Political discussions have been initiated with the aim of clarifying Russia's attitude for the time being. Irrespective of the results of these discussions, all preparations for the East, which have already been verbally ordered, will be continued. Instructions on this will follow as soon as the general outline of the Army's operational plans has been submitted to and approved by me. On the 5th of December, 1940, the Chief of the General Staff of the Army, at that time General Halder, reported to the Führer concerning the progress of the plans for the coming operation against the USSR. A report of this conference with Hitler is contained in captured document number 1799 PS. This is a folder containing many documents, all labeled annexes, and all bearing on Fall Barbarossa, the plan against the USSR. This folder was discovered with the war diary of the Wehrmacht Führungsstab and was an, apparently an enclosure to that diary. The report I am here referring to is Annex Number One and dated. December 1940. I now offer in evidence document number 1799 PS as U.S. Exhibit number 131. And I should also like to read into the record a few sentences from the report of 5 December 1940 
as they indicate the state of the planning for this act of aggression, uh, six and a half months before it occurred. Report to the Führer on 5 December 1940. The chief of the general staff of the army then reports about the planned operation in the east. He expanded at first on the geographic fundamentals. The main war industrial centers are in the Ukraine, in Moscow, and in Leningrad. Then skipping, the Fuhrer declares that he has agreed with the discussed operational plans and adds the following. The most important goal is to prevent that the Russians should withdraw on a closed front. The eastward advance should be combined until the Russian Air Force will be unable to attack the territory of the German Reich. And on the other hand, the German Air Force will be enabled to conduct raids to destroy Russian war industrial territories. In this way, we should be able to achieve the annihilation of the Russian army and to prevent its regeneration. The first commitment of the forces should take place in such a way to make the annihilation of strong enemy units possible. Then skipping again, it is essential that the Russians should not take up positions in the rear again. The number of 130 to 140 divisions as planned for the entire operation is sufficient. Would that be a good time to break off? Very convenient, sir. Uh, then we shall not sit uh, in open session tomorrow. We will sit again on Monday at 10 o'clock.